I maxed out two credit cards and I, I drained my savings account to make this video. And I, I put it online, it got about a million views. Um, oh, sorry, I did not plan on doing this. Usually when you go to conferences and somebody goes up on stage, they talk about all the successful things they've done. Here's how you should negotiate, and I know because I've had all these successful negotiations. And here's how you should be a creator because I'm a successful creator, and so take my advice. And I eventually got sick of these talks because I was looking at these people and I was like, there's no way you are like that all the time. There's no way you're just like, so confident and successful all the time. I don't know what it's like for you, but I can tell you what it's like for me. Most of my time is spent doing things that don't work. I wanted to make a talk where I talked about the misses, the things, all the things that I did that did not work, all the things that I tried that went nowhere, and I wanted people to see that. Nothing works. I'm gonna talk about all the things that don't work. Since I was a kid, pretty much everything I've ever done has been a complete trash fire of a failure. Uh, and actually that's not even true because most uh, trash fires are like at least spectacular. My failures were not. They were very ignorable and small and irrelevant. Like I have a box of thousands of CDs in my garage. I have probably 12 boxes of like 200 CDs each. It's like a reminder of all the albums that I made that I didn't sell. I tried to invent camera gear that literally just uh, died and went absolutely nowhere. I've mixed whole albums and then not released them because I was two years in and just so done with the project at that point and just never released it. I basically had miss after miss after miss after miss in my life freckled on occasion with like a spark of something that feels really good and awesome, followed by more misses over and over again. And this is really the truth. I, this is like the norm and it's not even the norm I think for being an artist, it's the norm for being a human freaking being. And yet when we go onto YouTube, we go to the movies, we hear stories of this like one instant, this snowflake of a moment where like everything clicks and feels awesome, and fuck that shit. So um, I'd prefer to hear a talk instead about that stuff, because this is the grind, right? This is like the real truth of being a person and being an artist. Those are the moments where I've grown, and I've learned, and I've face planted, and so these days I find myself gravitating less towards stories of like a random outlying success and more towards stories of exactly how to deal with the never-ending shit barrage of the human experience. <laughs> Uh, it's this stuff. It's like the day after day after day because that's most of life. And, and so that's what this talk is about because at the end of the day, nothing works. Um, including the current style of this talk. While it is super fun to sync up a slide every six words with new explanatory images, this presentation is already 45 slides and I've already been talking for 105 seconds, which is a little faster than a new slide every three seconds. And at that rate, I'd need 771 slides to talk for 30 minutes. And meanwhile, my calendar is a total trash fire, and my email is a total trash fire, and I don't have time to do this, so it's another bad idea. Um, uh, but what do you expect? Because nothing works. So, okay, actually, I am going to stop doing that now, and I'm going to... Um, like literally, okay. I had this idea, I was like, I'm gonna do this, it's gonna be fast, and then it, I didn't have time to do it. Okay, so what I did instead, and I am still gonna talk about nothing working over a long period of time, um, but instead I went through my iPhoto library, and I basically went from high school until now, and I just looked for all of the shit that fizzled. And so, so here we go, without further ado, here's the face plants. Since I was like a, a kid, yeah, this is me with a video camera. Um, I carried a camera everywhere I went, like on vacations, through high school, um, at, like when I traveled. I basically had a camera everywhere. All that footage is in my garage in boxes. Uh, I never did anything with it. It's sitting there, it's a dud. I also made a bunch of animations as a kid. This is a snowman. Um, it was stop motion animation. I worked so hard on these animations. Um, I've made a little Santa Claus thing, and uh, that's my buddy Adam Cohen. We made these animations together. We spent summer after summer after summer making these things. When you want to move a character's eyes in animation, you have to put in a toothpick and like shift it just a little bit and take out the toothpick and then take another picture. And animations are like 24 frames per second. So we'd work all day and we'd get about four to eight seconds of animation done. Um, and we would do that literally for like three months at a time. When you want a character to say something, you literally have to cut off the mouth and replace a new mouth with like a new vowel sound or a new like look. And then you have to smooth out the edges so you don't see the mouth of the character. Um, so much work, so much time, and nothing ever came of these animations. <laughs> YouTube didn't even exist, so literally no one saw them. Mukolopumba? 
Poloski Heimbekor. Oh, Chamuthglash. So I was the voice of the teenage boy in a video game called The Sims 2, and this is uh, me and my acting counterpart in the recording studio um, speaking gibberish. We'd go to the recording studio and speak for six hours. <laughs> But we decided to start a band called Now We Have Faces. Um, because we had voices, but now we were like, hey, let's use this as leverage to get fans and be musicians. You know, we recorded some songs and then it fizzled. More duds. This is um, my first album that I ever made. It's called Nightmares and Daydreams. That character on the front is one of my clay sculptures that I made and then I sort of silhouetted. Um, and I, I spent six months working on that album. It was four songs, three plays per day on MySpace, nothing. So I thought, okay, maybe I need to tour. Like, maybe playing live is the way to do it. Um, and so I booked four tours over the course of like two years. Um, moving up and down the West Coast with, with some of my friends. Don't ever tour in the Pacific Northwest in the winter. It's awful. But we played mostly like really shitty bars and mostly to empty rooms. We did the whole tour in two Priuses. Uh, I had a Prius, my buddy had a Prius. <laughs> and this is, this is my buddy Ryan. He was under 21. And so one night we got to the venue and the bartender asked him his birthday and he stuttered and so then the bartender like really looked at the ID and found out that it was fake and then wouldn't let him in to play his own show. <laughs> that same night, the headliner decided not to show up. So I literally played a 500 person room by myself and the thing about that was nobody came. So, um, <laughs> So it was me and the bar, I was playing a set for the bartender, and then about halfway through the set, the fucking bartender left. And I was literally, I was on, this, this is the stage, and I was looking out, and I was literally like, there is nobody in this room. And, and I kept playing, and I finished the set, but holy shit, that's a fucking dud, and it feels like a dud. Then I made this music video, and the idea was I fell in love with this girl in a painting, and she came out of the painting. You know, I built these cool costumes and this cool sunset thing, strapped up these like cotton ball clouds and had these lights overhead so it kind of looked like a sunset. And it was a really cool video and it, it actually got featured on YouTube and it got a little spike and then fizzled. At the time I was living at my dad's house, I felt a little weird about this. I graduated college, my friends were um, getting like really high paying jobs after graduating college and I wanted to be an artist. And so I was spending all my time, you know, trying to make music. I was building my studio by making this, um, like, pedals videos. Hi, my name's Jack Conti. I'm gonna tell you about the Electro Harmonics Holiest Grail. It's a fully programmable stereo reverb pedal. This is a, this is a company called Electro Harmonics. They would send me pedals, uh, guitar pedals, and I would make a demo for the, for the pedal of the video. I thought maybe because this company was behind them, they'd be pushing them and they'd like really go viral or something, and they did okay. And I was able to build my studio, but none of the videos really like hit or anything, and it didn't really end up getting anywhere, so okay. More duds. Duds, duds, duds. I'm gonna talk now about the first thing that I like ever did that I feel like actually worked. So this is Pomplamoose. Pomplamoose is a band that I started with my girlfriend at the time, now she's my wife, Natalie. Um, and we started making videos and it felt different. It, uh, we started getting like more views um, and people started listening to our music. We did get featured on the YouTube homepage again and after that we played a show. It is so much better to have 40 people at your show than no people at your show. I can't tell, it's like so much better. Not like 40, it's like infinitely better. And one day we were filming a video, my sister walks in, she had made grapefruit soap. Hey, hi. This is the soap that I named after. It's Pomplamoose soap? It may still be squishy. Oh. Uh, Pomplamoose means grapefruit. So she walks in holding grapefruit soap, and all our fans in the comments are like, oh my god, where do we get the Pomplamoose soap? Please give us the soap. And so we packed up Pomplamoose soap. That's what our fans sound like. Hello, I'm a fan. Um, <laughs> When we started selling Pomplamoose soap, that gave us the idea, maybe we can sell more things. And so we, uh, we put all of our music on a thumb drive um, and we sold, I, I don't know, a, a couple hundred of these thumb drives for like 10 bucks each and made a few thousand bucks. And again, it, like, it started to feel like something was working. We were actually starting to like, make some money here. Not a lot of money, but a little bit. And then like, a big thing happened. We booked a show at a laundromat. Um, yeah, that's a sentence that I just said. <laughs> 
Uh, it's a laundromat slash cafe. So the idea is you go do your laundry while you're eating, I guess. Right after we booked the show, we decided to cover Beyonce's single ladies. All the single ladies, 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 all the single ladies. This was the first video that we did that went viral, and it got about half a million views overnight, which in 2009 was a lot of views. And when we showed up to our show at Brainwash, there were 200 people inside. It was a 40 person cafe. And they were like, literally, I was playing like this, and there were people right here. And there were about 150 people outside, literally outside the venue, looking in through the windows. Um, and like, traffic had to like go around people. And it, this, this was one of the best nights of my life. Like, it felt like for the first time we had made something that really clicked and reached people, and I felt impactful as an artist. And that was. Such a joy after so many duds. Um, it was a wonderful thing. This is a record that we came out with. We sold 30,000 songs the month it came out. We made 22,000 bucks because we owned all our own masters. Um, we didn't sign with a label, right? So we just sold songs directly on iTunes and we got 70% of the proceeds and, um, and we, made, we made a little over 20,000 bucks. We reinvested it in our videos and we got you know, better camera gear and we invested in costumes and, and uh, sets and um, we did a tour and hundreds of people showed up to the tour and this is our first tour poster that all our fans signed. We opened for OK Go in Washington DC and fans started showing up to our shows like wearing custom Pomplamoose t-shirts that they had made. We played with Amanda Palmer and the Dresden Dolls at the Warfield for a Halloween show which was amazing and super fun. We made enough money through these brand deals and iTunes sales and things to, to buy a house. We ended up buying a house moved out of my childhood bedroom and took all our gear and packed up and built a new recording studio. And right around the time of building this studio, we got a call from Hyundai. Literally, the email was like, have you guys ever thought about being on TV? Um, <laughs> like, no, never thought about that. Up on the house, top, reindeer paws, out jumps good old Santa Claus. There's just something about driving a new Hyundai. I think a lot of folks might think that like doing a Hyundai commercial would be selling out. I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Maybe it's just I'm biased because I did the commercial. Um, but uh, to me, selling out is not doing art. Uh, doing something that enables you to do art and doing something that spreads your art to a massive audience and getting paid for that, that is the opposite of selling out to me. And so for me, this commercial was a thing that enabled me to do what I loved, to make. And, uh, and to build things. And so, um, you know, there was backlash. Like when, when you do something like this, you do a national commercial and, and people call you a sellout and that hurts a little bit. And inside I also knew that like, look, this is paying us, this was more money than we'd ever gotten in a chunk ever in my, in my whole life actually. This was amazing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, felt, it still felt good. Um, and it allowed us to reinvest in the recording studio and like build it out properly with like good sound foam and uh, good acoustics. Um, this is me at the time. I was super happy and to, to be there and to be building the studio. I had hair. Uh, this is, uh, we've got, we got this really cool barn wood um, for the walls that sounds amazing and reflects sound really well. We did a collab with Ben Folds. You smoke your little smoke and drink your little drink and try to make sense of the things that you think. He played the drums standing up, and he like held a microphone with his hand on the and while he played piano, which totally blew my mind because I was all wanting to follow the rules, and we have to use this kind of shock mount with that kind of condenser microphone. And Ben walks in with a microphone and goes, "Okay, hit record." And um, it was so he was such a fuck you artist. It was so great. Um, we played a show with him a couple years later at, at Warfield. We got better at like marketing the band and like taking awesome photos of ourselves. Yeah, you laugh. Whatever. We're cool. Okay, we're cool. Um, and like more people started showing up to our shows. So this is us playing at Warfield a couple of years ago. Uh, this was like a thousand person room. Uh, my, this is my wife crowd surfing because she's a badass. Okay, if there's a sound effect here, you can do it like a No, that's super cheesy. But I do want to stop here. Pompaloose was one thing. Pompaloose was one try, it was one swing in a sea of duds. Animations and videos and records and songs and experiments and all those things felt the same when I was doing them. It was just this one thing that for whatever reason worked and connected with people, um, but it was just one thing. After Pomplamoose, I kept trying things, 
that kept flopping and not working. I didn't tell the story like that. I tell the story like, and then we did a thing and everything worked afterwards and it felt really awesome, but that's not how it actually went down. At the time, right after all this was happening, we decided let's do a weekly webcast. That's gonna be awesome. And we put it on Ustream and people came, but we didn't make any money. And six months later, after doing a webcast per week, we were exhausted and we had to shut it down. I also got this idea, I'm gonna take like really cool, weird photos. And they were super weird and I combined them. <laughs> I combined them to make even weirder photos, uh, and no one cared about these photos, and so I stopped taking photos. <laughs> Beats me, I thought it was a cool photo. Okay. Um, then I, I, uh, we invited our fans to be in a music video of ours, and it was really fun. I was really proud of this video. Fizzled, hit YouTube, nothing happened. I was still making animations at the time too, so I, I was working on these animations that made these little monster creatures um, and, and they like shot up fruit. I actually animated fruit in real time exploding. Um, two weeks to make the animation, a really long two weeks. And then I spent another two weeks on the sound design. I read this book on sound design. <laughs> I cooked these giant vats of pasta that I like dug my hands into to make weird squishy fruit explosion sound effects. And the monsters totally got gored at the end and it was awesome, but the video went nowhere. Nobody gave a crap about this video. So much time. Natalie and I learned to dance. Um, <laughs> turns out I am a shitty dancer. Uh, Natalie's a great dancer. I'm not a good dancer. This was a dud. The real kicker for me, this was a tough one. I spent, oh my God, so much time planning out this video. I map out videos second by second and I really mapped out this video, like second by second. We got up at six today. It's now 1.45 p.m. and I've done 30 seconds of two minutes and 43 seconds. Mm. Built all these custom foam core sets to make this thing work and to look awesome. We had these three different worlds and they like, you know, it, it conceptually went from like, you know, uh, quiet and grayscale to like color and beautiful and, and elaborate. Um, and it was sparkly and we used this like projector to put light on the set and it was awesome. I was so pumped about it. We put this video on YouTube and I had never seen anything like it. It was as if YouTube forgot to publish the video to our subscribers. <laughs> It got, n like, nothing. Shots from the shot list. I thought this night would never end. I know. And I was right. Five and a half hours, 48 shots. Devastated. I killed myself to make this video. And I, I was sure that this is our masterpiece. This is a big one. And nothing happened. We kept doing stuff, even after the thing that worked, and it still felt bad. It still felt like playing that empty room to nobody, right? Um, Actually, it feels a little worse than that even, because at least when you're playing the empty room to nobody, you're like, well, my future's ahead of me. Um, <laughs> versus when you've made a thing that works, then you make a dud, you're like, fuck, I've peaked. Um, <laughs> and that's like terrifying. So, okay, so I've thought a lot about how to deal with this. I've thought about how to deal with the never ending ship barrage of the human experience. And here's how I think about it. And by the way, I don't mean for this to be prescriptive. This is how I think about it. Some people use this word grit. Some people use the word resilience. I, I think of it as like smoothing out my emotional curve. And I did another fast slidey thing because I really, I wanted to be precise with how I talk about this. We all have to deal with our own micro fails on a day-to-day -day basis. If you think of this as your day-to-day -day ups and downs, humans are typically terrible at dealing with this moment right here. The moment where shit starts to go south. You've got a song that you're really proud of but then you kept like refining it and adding lyrics and you're at that point, you're just like, oh, I hate this song. Anytime as a creative person where you take a hit and there's this moment where, oh no. It doesn't matter if you spent the last six months going up and to the right, the second it starts to turn south, we freak out. So if this is my trajectory as a musician, what I've found to be helpful for me personally is thinking about it as smoothing out the curve so that I can ride the long term instead of the day-to-day -day freak outs. But humans suck at smoothing out data. We have billions of years of evolutionary biology that induces freak out mode at the slightest threat, the slightest bump, where you think, maybe that was the last good idea I'll ever have. Maybe I've peaked, maybe I won't get another licensing deal, or I'll never write another good song, or I won't make any more money and I'm gonna be fucked. 
And we all have this reaction because there's this very densely packed collection of neurons in our brains called the amygdala, which is part of our limbic system. This feeling that we get when there's a threat, people know it as fight or flight you get super amped. There's this whole huge hormone cascade that results in the production of epinephrine, which is commonly known as adrenaline, which is literally used to treat heart attacks. Like it freaking jump starts your heart and gets your body pumping. That's what adrenaline does. And the resulting catastrophe is acceleration of heart and lung action. Your digestion stops, your sphincters tighten, you get constriction of your blood vessels, adrenaline gets all up in your liver, you release glucose into your blood, you get an instant sugar high. If you're a dude, your shit stops working. You get auditory loss, uh, you get paling and flushing. Um, and for your body, what you get is you get better blood flow to your muscles, you get increased blood pressure to like give you more energy, you get faster blood clotting in case a limb gets torn off or some shit. You get increased muscle tension to give you more speed and strength. And all of this is awesome if you are running from a lion. But if it sucks if you're just an artist trying to deal with the duds. When I get to this moment, that moment, and my idea fails, and I feel threatened and scared, there's a billion years of biology that kicks in and tries to initiate this whole hormone cascade and freak me out. And that's when I try to stop and zoom out. I welcome the new dud to the club, <laughs> and the accompanying feelings associated with it, and I try to just trust logic instead of adrenaline. I'm not really great at doing this every time yet, but I've gotten better. And at Patreon, I'm surrounded by folks who are awesome at this. I've learned a lot from them. Uh, and I'm sorry, Tyler, I'm gonna embarrass you right now. <laughs> Tyler is our Vice President of Operations at Patreon. He's a great guy. I wrote a letter of recommendation for Tyler recently, and I wanna read just a quick excerpt from this letter, because it, it's exactly what, I, what I'm talking about when it comes to grit. Being a VP Ops at a growing startup is like crossing a sinking field of mud with zero visibility, no clothes, and in the middle of a hurricane. It takes a special person who A, has the guts to do it in the first place, B, has the gall to pick a direction and run, and C, repeatedly face plants on a daily basis only to look up, spitting mud and laughing with a full heart and a savage appetite for the next plunge. That's Tyler. He's got more grit than a bowl of grits. <laughs> uh, so, um, this like ability that, that some people have to like be unfazed, right? Um, this would be a terrible thing if we still like lived in the wild. Like imagine if your emotions were, were you know, governed by averages over time instead of instant threats and fears. Like you'd see a lion in a field, you'd be like, well, on the whole, actually, I feel pretty good right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, face again, eaten off. Okay, so it's like a bad thing if we're in the wild. But the tragedy here of the human experience, the comical tragedy, is that as a species, we prefer smoother experiences. It's just more pleasant, like the day-to-day -day ups and downs fill our bodies with heart-pumping, digestion-stopping, sphincter-closing chemicals that make us just want to sit back and give up. No one wants a bumpy flight, but life is turbulence. And grit is the ability to smooth out the curve. Grit is the ability to self-apply an automobile suspension to the bumpy off-road adventures that make up our days. Okay, I'm gonna get back to the story now. This is the part of the story uh, where Pompelous is doing great. We're also still doing duds as it goes. Um, and this is where I start thinking about this discrepancy between how valuable artists feel themselves and what your paycheck is at the end of the day in dollars. Here's what I mean by that. Natalie and I did a, a over Christmas, we did a, a book drive for the Richmond School District. We put up a video, we said, hey, if you give a book uh, to the Richmond School District, we will give you our EP for free, our Christmas EP for free. Frank, we are inside a storage container on the campus of Leadership High School in Richmond, and what you see are packages, thousands of them. And the school district basically had to rent a shipping container. Um, there were 11,000 packages that got sent to the Richmond School District. It was about 140 or $150,000 of books. Um, and they kept rolling in like over the course of weeks. Um, so something like that happens, and right around the same time, this is not from the same month, but this is approximately the same time. Around the same time, we're getting about a million views per month on our videos, and that was making us 166 bucks um, in ad revenue. 
And that's what I'm talking about here. Because as a creator, I leave that moment with this Richmond School Drive, and it not only feels good, like, altruistically, like, great, I'm a good person, I've done something good for the world, it feels good, but it also feels good selfishly, like, wow, I have economic influence on people. Like, I can, there's, like, buying power behind a video that I put up. Like, it feels, even selfishly, it feels good to have that. And yet, I wasn't, our videos, the things that we put out in the world that people loved and responded to were not making us any money. And it wasn't that way with all products, right? Natalie did a Kickstarter campaign. She raised over 100,000 bucks on Kickstarter. That was the first moment where I was like, holy cow, there is no discrepancy here. This feels like she's being valued. Um, we did live webcasts on stage it. Your fans could buy a ticket to the show. So it's different than the first webcast we did, which was free. This webcast, fans could buy a ticket and then they could tip you on top of the show. Raindrops on roses, whiskers on kids. In, in a 45-minute show, we would make about uh, $2,000 doing this 45-minute show using Stage It. So we started doing them like all the time. We did like a show a month. These are a few of my favorite things. Whenever fans were involved, instead of just tech or advertisers, it always felt like we were more valuable, right? It was like, if fans get involved, they know what's up. And as soon as tech companies get involved, they have no idea what's up. So obviously this leads to like the second good thing in a line of not good things. Four years ago now, I started working on this robot music video. The idea was I was gonna be playing guitar in the middle and there'd be these robots coming out of uh, rotating elevators on either side of me playing dubstep electronic music. And the, the difficulty with this was, it got more and more complicated the more I was working on this. I ended up taking daily trips to Home Depot because the set kind of wouldn't come together. Um, so I started spending like, I, I, at first it was like just like a few hundred bucks and over a thousand bucks. Um, then I bought these roller blade wheels to try and get the elevators to come up and they didn't work very well so I had to buy this pulley system from Amazon and that didn't work very well. Finally I got a self-elevating desk and that worked but it was 400 bucks. Um, and at this point now, I'm like thousands of dollars in. I've maxed out one credit card. I'm maybe a month and a half into this. And I decide I'm gonna build a replica of the Millennium Falcon cockpit in my studio, and it's gonna be behind me. So I start framing a wall. And the things come together. I start building the panels for the Millennium Falcon. Um, and I'm spending more and more time in my studio at this point. Um, I'm making a behind the scenes video of all this because at the time, I remember thinking like, wait a minute, I'm gonna put this on YouTube and I'm gonna make $200 from this video. And there's no way I can like deal with that emotionally. I couldn't take the thought of just putting this one out there and watching it go boop and then go away. I couldn't take it. I, it's just, I, I, something needed to change. And that's when I sketched out this. I have this little uh, black book that I like keep ideas in. Uh, and this was the idea. Jack is making videos. Give Jack $1 per video. Digital asset monetization, not available right now. Uh, this, is, this is like Patreon V1. Give me a break, please. Okay. I called up my freshman year roommate, Sam Yam. Uh, yep. uh, he um, got super excited about it, started writing the code for it that night, started building the product. I went back to the studio, started building out more of these panels. Um, remember, my, my wife at this point, she's away on tour. She signed a record deal with Warner, and so she's out touring. I'm spending more and more time in the studio making these things. Sam is suffering through building the V1 of this code base. Um, I love showing these pictures of Sam. Um, I, God, I love it so much. He suffered, uh, so much suffering to make it come to life. Uh, he was like, oh, he would sleep for an hour at a time and wake up in bed and keep coding. Um, I was suffering as well in a different sort of way. Um, I was like hoarding garbage at this point. Like, <laughs> nobody was like making sure I was eating or sleeping. My hands were an absolute wreck. These are my hands after, uh, after like three months of working on this video, like 18 hour days. I wrote a blog post at the time. It really describes where my head was at this time. Usually I'm careful. I'm a well-educated son of a doctor, it's true, from the suburbs. Um, I make good decisions, but the consistent weight of choices, the financial discretion, the same good sense that has kept me afloat as an artist would keep me from making this video. After all, there's zero potential return on investment, right? So at the beginning of this process, I decided to bury my sculpted prudence in the backyard for a month. Maybe I'll dig it up when this video is finished, but right now it only stands between me and my fun little art project. That's what it feels like. 
I'm gluing frosty paper onto washers, cutting cardboard boxes and spray painting them silver. And all the while I'm watching my savings melt into nothing. I feel like a guilty child, slotting quarter after quarter into a shiny arcade. That's what I felt like as an artist. I get a little emotional reading that, to tell you the truth. I really felt bad. Ugh. Um, and the set like finally came together. It actually worked. Um, but I still had this feeling, I, I maxed out two credit cards at this point. God, I'm sorry I didn't sleep last night, and so I'm a little emotional. I maxed out two credit cards, and I, I drained my savings account to make this video. Um, and I, I put it online, it got about a million views. Um, oh, sorry, I did not plan on doing this. Uh, okay. <laughs> I need what Tyler's got. I don't have enough adrenal gland shit blockers yet. <laughs> Fight or flight mode. So that's a video. It featured these electro harmonics pedals that I had made these demos for. We posted the video online. Hello everybody, welcome to my Patreon page. Within about two weeks, my patrons had pledged 5,000 bucks per video to me. And I was, I was like, I was saved. At the same time, I got like a double dose of, of patronage. The CEO of electro harmonics had seen my video and he sent me a check for 5,000 bucks. It wasn't like an advertisement for their pedals. He just saw it and was grateful that I featured pedals in the video and like all that work I'd ever done. It felt like it like paid off in that moment. It has multiple independent parameter controls like diffusion. So I'm currently making eyeballs. Las Vegas, Long Beach, Bakersfield. We kept building the company. Sam was like building code, going crazy, cranking this thing out. We started launching creators right away. Peter Hollins launched on Patreon. Chris Reiniak, who's here. <clears throat> so many creators started launching and getting paid. It was magic. The team was super small at first. We were like seven people for the first year in a two bedroom apartment making this stuff together. It felt just like anything else. Uh, it felt like anything I'd ever worked on. Just keeping grinding, making Sam was still working from his freaking bed. Uh, like literally in bed. <laughs> the team was working so late. God, we were getting so many emails from patrons and creators who wanted features and, and who had problems and we were just grinding. I remember when we hit 100,000 bucks pledged to creators, we hung up this banner in the office. It was so exciting. We got our, our second round of funding. We, we signed our term sheet at a Lindsey Sterling concert, one of my favorite creators on YouTube. It was $15 million of funding. Uh, and we got a bigger office and moved into this awesome office. Um, and we, you know, at that point, we started growing the team. Now Patreon is about, uh, you know, almost 100 folks. This year, actually, alone, in 2017, we're going to send $150 million to creators. Um, yeah. The way I told that is like, oh, then there's a thing and it all worked. And, and, um, and it, didn't, it didn't, right? That's, again, it's just not how life is and you still gotta deal with more duds, one after the next, even after all of this. Uh, so here's examples of duds that happened all during Patreon. This is a daily vlog that I started. Hi everybody, welcome back to the vlog. It never grew, nothing ever happened, it just didn't take off, killed the vlog. I had a show with my wife called Mornings with Pomplamoose. We started a morning show. Invite your mom and dad to play along. <laughs> Six months later, we killed it. Didn't work. I built a pizza oven in my backyard. Um, this fucking pizza oven sucks. Seriously, it makes, I have never, like, you can't make bad pizza. And somehow, we made bad pizza. It was so bad. So the duds continue. Uh, the duds continue, one after the next. And that's life here. Maybe I'll end with um, a, a story uh, that I remember I, I tell pretty often, but for me, it's pretty emblematic of, of being a creator. I was at a cocktail party. It was like a Christmas kind of thing. And my parents had invited me to this party. So it was with a bunch of their friends. This is at the time when Pomplamoose is really cranking. So we just did those Hyundai commercials. We bought a house, we built recording studios. Like I was feeling pretty good, actually. 
mingling, this fellow said, hey, Jack, what do you do? And I said, uh, I'm a musician. And he like shakes my hand, he gets really sober. He puts a hand on my shoulder and he says, I hope you make it someday. Oh. And like, um, when you're dealing with the duds over and over and over, a, a sentence like that can just be so uh, hurtful and raw and intense. Um, and uh, my hope for for creators moving forward is that at least if you have a monthly income, it can take some of the pain away from that. At least if you don't have to worry about the next thing uh, not making you any money, but you have a regular paycheck and you know how much money you're gonna make next month, um, that it can reduce some of that pain associated with just the plight of the creator. So that's, that's my hope for Patreon and, and, and for all of you too. <laughs>